Hello and welcome to the 24th 2020 Draft Recap here at Scout Chain. From the Buffalo Sabres, which was a team that went through a significant amount of organizational turnover in 2020, the Florida Panthers were no different. Everyone in this organization seems to be new, and I thought that they started off their new era with an extremely positive draft. To start things off at 12th overall, the Florida Panthers just closed their eyes and took the one guy that slipped to them at 12 in Anton Lindell. This is a no-brainer. He was the best player available to me at 12, and I really didn't see it as that close of an argument. I really, really like what Anton Lindell brings to the board. He might not be a franchise cornerstone foundational talent down the road, but I do think he's going to be a player that both fans and coaches and the analytics all really, really like all at the same time. He's smart, he's effective, he's responsible at both ends of the ice, and he just enables so much positive play out of his line mates. The only things I really critiqued about his game were a lack of finesse and skill, especially when he was really pushing his body to its limits at high speeds on the ice. But his season so far in the league of this year has been frankly outstanding, and it really seems like from what I've seen, these things have taken a step in his game. So if these things continue to develop, and this is the Anton Lindell that he's going to become, I really think that this is going to be an important player for the Florida Panthers down the road. He's got some great role models in that Panthers organization to work with and develop with and grow with, and I think there's a really bright future for Anton Lindell and the Florida Panthers down the road. I'm not sure what else to say, but Panthers fans, I think you got an important player here at 12th overall. At 43rd, the Panthers took Emil Heinemann, and I've seen Heinemann play a lot, I've tracked him quite Quite a bit in the SHL, and he is a player who I still think is learning to figure out what he's capable of while still making mistakes along the way that he still needs to rectify. His defensive transition game is very focused on straight line attacking, taking the body, and primarily focusing on going for the body rather than the puck. And if he misses, he's left completely in the dust by the opposing forechecker. That led to some of the worst defensive transition metrics I tracked for any forward this season. But when it comes time to transitioning pucks up the ice, and moving pucks around the offensive zone, and especially playing right around the net in tight, I really liked what Haneman brings to the table. Similar to the Buffalo Sabres taking John Jason Paterka, I see a similar style of brand here from Haneman. I don't expect huge things out of him in his NHL career, but I expect him to be a serviceable power forward with some decent offensive ability. I think he has all the tools to put that together, and I've seen him absolutely crush people in the SHL from time to time. So I think this is a player that just by virtue of the way that he plays the game, will get NHL time. I don't know how impactful it'll be overall, but I certainly see the potential with this player, and I think he could be a serviceable NHLer down the road. At 74th, the Panthers took a flyer on Ty Smolanich. This was a player that some people had ranked as a first round pick going into this season, and he did battle injuries over the course of this year. So at 74, I really don't see the issue with this pick. I've seen some high-end speed and high work ethic and good play away from the puck out of Ty Smolanik with some decent offensive potential to go along with it. I think that this was a player that fought injuries and you didn't get to see what he was fully capable of this season. And I think if you did see what he was fully capable of, you could have seen him as maybe a second round pick this year. So getting him in the third round has no complaints from me. He's a hard-working two-way player who plays well both with and without the puck and I don't think you can have too many of those players. You can let him develop in college and see where his game goes and if he can overcome the injuries that he's been dealing with. But I like this pick for the Florida Panthers as well. At 87th, the Panthers took Justin Sordiff. Now, Justin Sordiff is a player who is another one of these hard-working, gritty, offensive-leaning players. I don't know if his game projects nearly enough to be an NHL player, but I do see the potential for him to be an extremely high-level junior hockey player. He's got slippery skill when you least expect it, He's got some nice quick footwork to just gain that extra couple feet of space to create breakaway opportunities from time to time. He plays hard away from the puck. He gives opponents very little time to think. And I find all of these things relatively projectable. He's a smart off-puck player with some good skill with it. And I think there's an interesting package to work with here. I just worry about the pace of his game, his lack of foot speed, and his reliance on skill and physicality away from the puck to generate his production as things that might hold him back from the NHL. But I do think that this goes along with a theme for the Florida Panthers this year of just taking guys who go out there, work hard, and earn what they get. This is now what I would call at least the third player out of their first four picks that are characterized by that style of play. I find it admirable and we'll see how it turns out for them down the road. 
There might have been some higher ceiling picks here, but these players might all just end up being really good role players that you just really like to watch play hockey for the Panthers one day, if not impact players. At 95th, the Florida Panthers took a player who is notably not Kale McCarr in Michael Benning. Now, Michael Benning scored a lot of points in the AJHL. I personally don't really see how projectable his game is. The AJHL pace of play is not nearly what it is, even in the WHL. I remember that Michael Benning was a player who at the Junior Club World Cup was playing for the AJHL All-Stars and he was a player I was primarily interested in and he wasn't that much of an impact player even when he was on bigger ice overseas. I think he's got some good skill, he's got some good offensive creativity and he can certainly quarterback a power play but this was a team that was on the power play a lot. This was also a team that was at four on four a lot and I think this was something that they tried to do more and more, which in the NHL, you do not get as much of a chance to do. So I'm not sure how his game will project, but going to Denver, this is a program that likes guys with skill, even if they have some work to do with their feet and speed generation overall. So we'll see what happens with Benning over the next few years, but I would not be surprised if there was at least an adjustment period for him coming out of the AJHL, just like there was for a player like Dylan Holloway last year. I think his defensive game is really difficult to project, if at all. His offensive game was really hit or miss to me, especially in offensive transitions at 5-on-5, five five. but there is an interesting baseline of skill and passing intelligence to work on with Benning, so we'll see. At 105th, the Florida Panthers drafted Zach Ewens. Now, Zach Ewens is a player who has a lot of positive data to his name, at least when you look at his production. Now, he's not on the best NCAA program, and whenever I watched him play this year, I didn't really come away with the impression that he really screamed the production that he was getting. It's 105th overall, so you can't really be too picky about this, but I don't really see the potential for Zach Ewens to be an NHL player one day. There's certainly potential for me to be wrong as he has multiple years left in his NCAA time, but I never came away with the impression that this was a guy, especially for an undrafted player last year, that I would target in this year's draft. He works hard, he's got some decent skill, but his puck management and overall ability to drive play was to me a little bit underwhelming. So we'll wait and see, but I felt like at 105 there were some more interesting picks to make. At 153 they drafted Casper Putio. Now I've tracked Casper Putio a little bit this season, and let me tell you, the Swift Current Broncos were a team, to quote a famous NHL general manager, uh, they weren't great. And to me, he was a big reason why they weren't worse. He's an interesting case of one of these Finnish defensemen who is not afraid to pinch up in the offensive zone or pinch up in the neutral zone to try to snuff out breakouts early. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and learning to manage those instincts over time are going to be important steps for Putio to overcome. I've seen him a little bit since he's gone back to Finland this season, and he looks fine. If he's a capable bottom pair defenseman one day for the Panthers, which I think is possible, then you've got a great pick at 153. I think his puck management has real flashes of upside, he's got some decent skill, but if his skating doesn't really come a few steps and his management of when to make those pinches doesn't improve, I think there's a bit of a shorter runway for Putio to be an NHL player. If he works out at all, which I think is possible, you've got yourself a great pick here. At 198, Elliot Ekmark went off the board, and this was a player that I would have been shocked to see not drafted, and was a player that I tracked a few games of this year. I really like Elliot Ekmark, at least as a complimentary off-puck focus scorer. I found that he was able to find open ice in the offensive zone very well, and drive dangerous shot attempts at a rate that was really impressive. He wasn't a tremendous play driver in either direction, which is probably what led to him slipping a bit, and he certainly had a better first half than second half, but I do like the potential of his game as an off-puck offensive player. He's got a great shot and a great offensive mind. So at 198, he could work. If he doesn't, no big deal. But I think at the very least, this is going to be a good scoring offensive player in Sweden that might be able to come over and project as an NHL player, especially if his involvement in two-way transition play could take a step or two over the next little while. And at 212th, they drafted Devin Levi playing in the CCHL, which is a step below the OJHL. A goaltender playing at that low a level is always questionable to me, but I did like him at the World Junior A Championship from what I saw, but I also can't help but think about the last CCHL goaltender to be drafted at all in the NHL draft in Colton Point, who was a goaltender struggling to get over a 900 save percentage in the ECHL, years after the year he was drafted. So I'm not entirely optimistic about Devin Levi overall, but what I have seen, he looks fine. And at 212, if you get anything, great. You've done a great job. And I think Devin Levi is a perfectly fair swing to take here. If he doesn't work, no big deal. If he works, great. So for the Florida Panthers, I'm giving them a 1C. I think overall, this was a great draft class for them. They might end up with at least 
four serviceable NHL hardworking admirable players. I think Anton Lindell is pretty much a shoe in to be a middle six center for this team. I think Emil Heinemann is pretty much a shoe in to be a bottom six energy power forward. Ty Smolanic has the potential to be something much better than a 74th overall pick. I think Justin Surtif is a hardworking piece that's going to maximize his potential one way or the other. And with Benning and Putio and Ekmark, I think there's some interesting skilled options that you can build on for the next few years and just kind of see what happens. And with Devin Levi, he's a goalie who's been performing well in the level that he's played at and internationally when he gets the chance. So who knows? We'll see what happens. And if Zach Ewens is just the one guy in this crop that was just not the best pick, I don't think you can really complain about this crop overall. So I think the Panthers are turning over a new leaf looking in a different direction, but that direction is relatively clear to me. And I think they're going to end up with some interesting NHL prospects to keep an eye on for the future. So that's it for the Florida Panthers recap. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, you can click all the buttons you see below me so you never miss another one. If you really liked it, you could subscribe on Patreon or here on YouTube by clicking join below. You get access to a Discord server, early access to videos, data sheets for hundreds of drafted and undrafted prospects, as well as plenty of other goodies. Or you can pick up some merchandise from the Scouchware shop, where 50% of profits go to the Women's Sports Foundation. So that's all, and we'll see you in the next one, where we look at the New York Islanders.